What is up guys, this is Lou Kill, and this is the new Ryzen Threadripper 3990X, the 64 core, $3,990 beast. Yes, we're going to take a look at it. So before I break this process of the costs more than my laptop, my TV and my phone combined, I'm going to put it down and then we'll go into more details. Right off the bat, I'm going to start this by saying, fundamentally, this is the bigger brother of the 3960X and the 3970X Threadripper. So if you want more details about the Threadripper 3000 processors, the STRX4 socket and the TRX40 platform, make sure you go on over and check out our full written review on Kikaroo and our full video review for those processors. There's no point repeating all the details here because we went into a lot of detail there. Base clock-wise, the 64-core chip comes in at 2.9 GHz with a maximum boost up to 4.3 GHz, so a bit slower than the 24 and 32-core alternatives for the maximum boost clock, and certainly a bit slower on the base frequency, but as we know, Precision Boost 2 will ramp that up when it can. The TDP is still 280 watts, like the 24-core and 32-core versions, so what that means is basically the 64-cores get less power between them, which means in turn the voltage is going to have to be lower, and the frequency will be lower. And we see that from the base clock. If you look at a comparison to EPIC, however, the 64-core EPIC 7742, which was the flagship except the 7H12, which is a kind of a custom-built version, that runs at 225 watts by default, and it can be ramped up to about 240 watts, but it's lower frequency than this chip. So clearly AMD understands that workstation users do actually need frequency as well as cores, even at this level, and that is good to see. As is the case for other Zen 2 parts, you get 0.5 megabytes of L2 cache per core, so in this case you get 32 megabytes total. You get the same 32 megabytes of L3 cache per CCD, and because here we have 8 CCDs, so 8 fully populated 8 core CCDs, you now get 256 megabytes of total L3 cache, and that's double the 24 and 32 core Threadripper chips. That is a monumental amount of level 3 cache. And just a bit of housekeeping, so not some of the obvious points, STRX4 socket, TRX40 chipset, quad channel memory, obviously DDR4, uh, 280 watt TDP like we've already said. Basically it's fundamentally the same as the other Threadripper chips. It fits into the same platform. It's just bigger and perhaps better. Let's have a look, eh? Our test system for the Ryzen Threadripper 3990X processor uses the Asus ROG Zenith 2 Extreme Alpha motherboard and the MSI TRX40 Creator, so two very high-end TRX40 motherboards. And the reason we use two is just to check the data between them where relevant. And these were the two that had the 1003 AGISA profile and the BIOS for the MSI was specifically provided to us by AMD. And we checked this against the non-AMD provided BIOS on the ASUS board. Memory comes in the form of a 4x8 gigabyte kit of 3200MHz C14 G-Skill Trident Z RGB DDR4. The Samsung BDI ICs under the hood still prove their worth, even though Zen 2 is a good match for more expensive 3600 C16 modules. CPU cooling is handled by the Cooler Master Wraith Ripper. We specifically use this air cooler as it has a TR4 sized contact plate and our own testing has shown that cooling Threadripper's large heat spreader can cause cooling challenges with smaller AO cold plates. Pixel pushing power comes from Gigabyte's Beastly Aorus RTX 2080 Ti Extreme graphics card. This triple slot monster pushes the GPU performance to a level where we can identify differences between competing solutions. We use a custom fan curve to minimize thermal throttling and ensure consistency between test configurations. Power is delivered by the new Sasonic Prime TX 1080 Plus Titanium Rated PSU. This one kilowatt beast serves up clean power and a pair of 8-pin CPU connectors that are ideal for our overclocking stress tests. Make sure you check out the Kikaroo website for more details on the test hardware, the comparison platforms, and the details on our test procedures. Let's get into the performance. On the 3990X, all core frequencies hovered around 2900 to 3100 megahertz for sustained workloads. So initially in Cinebench, you'd get a little bit higher, but it kind of teetered off to about 3 gigahertz realistically across all cores and Blender was about 2950 megahertz all core. So for 64 cores in a 280 watt package, about three gigahertz is not bad in my opinion. It's pretty good, I'd say. Of course, this was using the Cooler Master Wraith Ripper CPU cooler that we've already mentioned in our test system. 
The maximum boost clock is 4.3 GHz according to AMD, but with the latest the GSA 1003 profile on the MSI motherboard, we actually saw 4350 being hit as the peak point consistently. So that's good to see. I have no real concerns that the AGISA profile is problematic. It seems to be working very well, as does the processor for single core boosts. Overclocking is particularly challenging because we've got 64 cores and a big power requirement if we want to push the frequency to deal with. So our first step was to enable PBO. We basically removed all the shackles, so 1000 watts, 1000 amps, 1000 amps in the BIOS, and said to the processor, right, here you go, take all you can. And actually we found that that was really a good solution. We didn't need to manually overclock. And the reason being is that our Wraith Ripper CPU cooler was glued to 95 degrees Celsius and the CPU all call frequency for sustained back-to-back -back workloads of Cinebench and long period Cinebench was about 3.5 to 3.55 gigahertz. So clearly given the temperatures and the operating frequencies, that's as far as we could push. And that's a pretty good result for 64 cores. On that point, PBO theoretically should be able to push further if you can cool it appropriately. The Wraith Ripper was glued at 95, so it was dropping the clock speed and the voltage to keep the power in check. But we did test with this beast. So make sure you keep your eyes peeled later on in the review where we will show some of the performance numbers. And I'm going to do a shameless plug, but they are remarkable. Check that out. Starting off with the PsySoft Sandra memory bandwidth test, we see an interesting result. Despite using the same quad-channel DDR4-3200CL14 memory, the 3990X scores relatively weakly in terms of outright memory bandwidth. We see a similar reduction in performance when looking at the difference between the 32-core 3970X and the 24-core 3960X. All Threadripper 3000 CPUs feature the same central I.O. die memory controller, but our data suggests that there is a fight for the bandwidth as increasing numbers of cores are trying to carve out their fair allocation of system RAM. It will be interesting to see if this has an effect on our test results. More Infinity Fabric links to the I.O. die, brought about by a larger number of CCDs, outline the importance of high-speed memory. We continue to use 3200MHz DIMMs with tight timings, but my previous testing has outlined that AMD suggestions to use 3600MHz memory and an 1800MHz Infinity Fabric clock by default are entirely justified. Latency performance for the memory subsystem is about where we would expect. We do not notice any major deficits versus the alternative Threadripper 3000 options, though the 24-core 3960X is consistently a little quicker. Cinebench NT numbers in both R15 and R20 are quite simply magnificent. AMD has clearly opened up a new level of performance in this real-world benchmark, so much so that we had to rescale our chart axis. All 128 threads were usable thanks to the way in which Cinebench is built. Comparing R20 numbers to its 32 core sibling, the 3990X is 45% faster at stock and 75% better when both CPUs are overclocked using PBO. It is quite remarkable to see Cinebench breaking through the 30,000 point barrier when overclocked. Doubling the core count posts a stock versus stock performance uplift of 40% for the 3990X in R15. That lead for the 64 core extends to 65% when both CPUs have their power delivery shackles eliminated by PBO. These levels of performance truly are remarkable and are unlike anything we have ever seen on a high-end desktop or single CPU workstation platform. Unsurprisingly, given its lower maximum boost frequency, the 3990X cannot quite match 3960X or 3970X levels of single-threaded performance in Cinebench. As we can see from the comparison to Intel's high-end desktop processors, albeit at a lower cost than the 64-core Threadripper, it is clear that the AMD chip does a good job of balancing lightly threaded workloads with the ability to ramp up to a 128 thread render when required. The 3990X is stellar in this single threaded test and that's perfectly fine when you credit how immense its multi-threaded performance is. The superb Precision Boost 2 algorithm is to thank. We've updated our Blender test to use the latest version 2.81a. This means that our previous 2.79b test data is no longer comparable. As such, comparison figures in these charts are currently light while we continue to gather data. The quick BMW test absolutely flies when all 128 threads on the 3990X are loaded. Cutting 20 seconds off the render time compared to the overclock 3970X is certainly not a result to underestimate when the performance improvement converts into 69%. The longer classroom test is another clear success for AMD's 64-core high-end desktop flagship. Even operating in stock conditions, the 3990X completes the render in less than 100 seconds, a full 50 seconds faster than the stock clock 3970X. That results in a 53% performance uplift. 
Open the taps with PBO enabled and the 3990X takes 63 seconds off the overclock 32 core Threadripper. 82% higher performance from 100% more cores and cash money is an attractive proposition for certain buyers. The Gooseberry test is an interesting result and perhaps more representative to certain target markets for Threadripper. As this test has periods of lightly threaded preparation work before completing a multi-threaded render, the performance gains for the 64-core chip aren't as wide as in the previous test runs. A victory of 101 seconds versus the stock 3970X translates into 38% higher performance, while PBO increases the 64-core's lead to 115 seconds and 47% greater render throughput capability. Corona 1.3 Benchmark is another new addition to our test suite and therefore has limited comparison data currently. This rendering application works well with all 128 threads and therefore the 3990X delivers clear performance uplift. Compared to the 32 core 3970X, the 3990X is 12 seconds quicker at stock and extends its lead to 13 seconds with both chips overclocked. The formula thus far has been pretty simple. If your application can take advantage of 128 threads, the 3990X can deliver massive performance uplifts and can go some way to justifying its higher price tag depending on what business you're in. That is not always the case, however, as many applications simply will not see more than 64 threads due to the way in which Windows groups the processor groups in 64 thread bundles. And there are plenty of common real world day to day applications where this is the case. So our testing from this point onwards is basically showing applications that don't really benefit from 64 cores and 128 threads. 7-Zip does not make use of more than 64 threads and therefore offers no meaningful performance improvement versus the 3970X. The abilities of Precision Boost 2 mean that the 3990X increases its multi-threaded clock speed accordingly when only 64 threads are loaded, thus allowing it to run at frequencies comparable to the 32-core Threadripper. Decompression actually runs slightly worse on the 3990X compared to the 3970X. Repeated tested on different motherboards confirmed this result, so this would look to be the first negative outcome from the 3990X's reduction in recorded memory bandwidth. Adobe Media Encoder is another application that does not benefit from 64 cores for our test workload specifically. As previously noted, there is plenty of computational headroom in excess of 60% left untapped even at the toughest points of our 4K H.264 video export. That leaves plenty of capability for the 3990X to multitask with minimal slowdown. AMD's testing guide highlights how more demanding workloads, such as dealing with high resolution raw footage and H.265 outputs, stress the CPU more heavily and show some benefits for the 64 core 3990X. This is something that I'll be keen to do follow up testing on post launch. A Precision Boost 2 clock frequency deficit versus the Threadripper 3000 alternatives is to blame for the 3990X's reduced performance in handbrake. This is interesting and surprising, but is confirmed by our data logs. The 3970X approaches operating frequency levels that are close to the 3990X's peak boost clock. The 64 core chip is therefore less comfortable operating at those lofty frequencies, even though some cores are sat idling and there is package power budget remaining. Our X265 handbrake test shows similar behaviour whereby the 3990X is comparable to the 24 and 32 core chips. Intel high-end desktop parts and their fat AVX pipelines still rule the show when it comes to X265 performance in handbrake. Clearly, handbrake offers no tangible performance gains for the 3990X as it cannot address more than 64 threads. If you simply run handbrake and step away from your system, there is no benefit from the 64 core chip. But if you convert your high res video footage in handbrake whilst also exporting from Media Encoder or Adobe Premiere, whilst also packaging up the raw A roll footage using 7-Zip, maybe then the 3990X and its heavy multitasking capabilities will come into play. POV Ray currently only supports up to 64 threads, even with the latest beta version available via GitHub. AMD has told us they've submitted an updated version that supports 128 threads and it is awaiting GitHub approval. This test is simply more of what we have seen from other 64 thread limited applications. The 3990X roughly matches the 3970X, barring some small performance losses for frequency differentials. Yes, you can game on the 3990X. 990X if you want to, but I see no reason why you would want to. I would perhaps go as far as arguing that if you're the type of system user whose PC is not crunching numbers, completing simulations or rendering images overnight, and therefore has time to be used for gaming, the 3990X is perhaps not even for you. With that said, Shadow of the Tomb Raider ran perfectly well without needing to use the core disabling game mode. 
In fact, the 3990X was slightly faster than the 3970X on average, and this follows a similar trend of this game's preference for higher core count chips, even if they're clearly not 100% utilised. If you want to see more gaming numbers, look at our 3970X review, as the 3990X is likely to continue with similar performance. Unsurprisingly, the 280 watt TDP 3990X demands the same amount of power as the other 280 watt TDP Threadripper chips, around 400 watts under heavy all core load. The differences between our Threadripper 3960X and 3970X versus the 3990X idle readings pertain to variations between the test motherboards used in each case, so you can basically ignore these. It is actually quite remarkable to see AMD offering more than three times as many cores as Intel's high-end desktop flagship, while only commanding around 60 watts more power under stock load conditions. Removing the power limit in shackles by using Precision Boost Overdrive, AMD's Threadripper 3990X becomes extremely thirsty. Our readings highlight power draws of around 700 watts at the wall once the PBO frequencies settle to sensible stable points. For the first runs, where temperature-induced PBO throttles have not kicked in, we recorded almost 900 watts of power draw from the wall. If you were not convinced that the overclocked Threadripper 3990X will need a high wattage power supply and serious cooling, you should be now. And don't forget about the demand placed on a motherboard VRM. These numbers highlight clearly just how far outside of the Zen 2 optimum power efficiency range the 3990X has to operate to jump from around 3 GHz stock all-core clocks to around 3.5 to 3.6 GHz overclocked all-core frequency. Make sure you check out the written article for more details on our power testing. Huge multi-threaded resources and a power-efficient yet reasonable operating frequency are ingredients for success in our Cinebench performance per watt metric. This is important to professional buyers who either individually or through a company must consider electricity usage. Being able to get renders done with higher efficiency can, at scale, translate into tangible savings on project costs across a team of staff. The price premium commanded by a flagship product rarely paints a positive picture in our performance per pound chart. That trend continues for the 3990X, which comes in at 100% more expensive than the 3970X, but does not deliver 100% more performance. This really is a case of buyers being able to justify the additional expenditure, even if it is not particularly cost efficient, by being able to complete more high value project work in a given period of time. Paying an extra £2,000 for a processor that offers performance levels that allow you to take on £3,000 of extra work can make business sense in many people's models. Using the Cooler Master Wraith Ripper, recorded temperatures were very low at just over 60 degrees Celsius. This is because the temperature profile of AMD Zen 2 processors is frequency biased and the lower frequency of the 3990X allows it to operate at a lower core voltage and therefore lower temperatures. That's a lot of lowers. You will notice spikes above 75 degrees Celsius during usage as the frequency is ramped up by Precision Boost 2 when fewer cores are loaded or when there's power budget available. But our sustained all core testing highlights that the 3990X is just as easy to cool as the 24 core and 32 core siblings. Of course, that logic completely changes when the power shackles are smashed with the Precision Boost overdrive overclock and applied. The 64 core beast quickly runs into its 95 degrees Celsius maximum temperature target and therefore downclocks accordingly. Software reported CPU package power was in the order of 500 watts for these readings. However, extended stress tests run in towards the one hour mark, so the delivered package power dropped to around 400 to 450 watts in order to stick to the 95 degrees Celsius target. Make sure you check out the written article for more details on our thermal testing. All that talk of thermals gives us a perfect segue across to this beast, and I'm gonna reach around and grab this, and it's very heavy. I had visions of it dropping this on the process today. I'm very thankful that I didn't. So what is this? This is the Ice Giant Pro Siphon Elite prototype version. So it's prototype because it's thicker, for protection it's going to be a relatively thin unit when it comes to market in may or june so what is this beast this is fundamentally an air cooler with a new type of technology inside that doesn't use conventional heat pipes like the other air coolers we see air coolers have clearly got some benefits they've got no moving parts to the heat sink they don't have pumps they don't have liquid that's kind of leakable inside them therefore from a redundancy resiliency reliability point of view Air coolers are very, very good, but on higher thermal loads, they just do not have the performance that liquid can offer. The Ice Giant Pro Siphon Elite aims to change that. Fundamentally, the way in which this cooler works is that a dielectric fluid is boiled down at the heat exchanger so that 
contact for the CPU. The evaporator boils the fluid by passing the heat through from the CPU. This vapor then flows through the heat exchanger. The heat is dumped off to the fins, which are then dissipated. The energy is shifted by the fans. And then, thanks to gravity, the liquid, because it's now condensed, because it's dumped its heat, the liquid then returns to the evaporator, picks up, and then continues again. So it's a continuous cycle, unlike heat pipes, which at high thermal loads can dry out where the vapor basically saturates the heat pipe and the liquid cannot reach the cold plate that is connected to the CPU. So you have limited thermal performance at that point. I'd advise you to go over to Ice Giant's website and have a look at more of the details there, which can have a brief look at the performance in this review. And I do plan to do some follow-up work with this cooler, so we'll have a look at more details. But if you're really interested in the technology, head over to the website. The blog page is very good and explains it very well. It's going to be 120 US dollars for the initial batch. So I was quite surprised. If this is good performance at $120, this could be a bargain for Threadripper because those coolers aren't cheap and Threadripper is tough to deal with from a thermal perspective. Let's have a look at the performance. So our first quick test was a simple manual overclock using the 64 core Threadripper and we programmed that to run at about 1.07 volts under load and this was just simply 3.5 gigahertz. It was relatively easy to deal with. Even the Cooler Master Wraithripper could deal with this temperature. So according to the wall socket, we were actually pulling 520 watts for the system and according to software readings that was 385 watts to the CPU package itself. So at 385 watts to be cooling that Threadripper chip down to about 72 or so degrees Celsius, 71, 72, that is highly impressive. Now the fans are high RPM at 2200 RPM and they are loud and you know this is still a prototype but I was rather impressed. So I wanted to send it on to a bigger challenge than Cinebench and Ada at this level of thermal load. So the bigger challenge was Precision Boost Overdrive. In the UEFI for the Asus motherboard, we basically just unshackled the limits, just about 1,000 watts, 1,000 amps, 1,000 amps. So just said to the processor, here you go, take all that energy, do what you do. Now with the Cooler Master Wraith Ripper, we actually struggled. So it very, very quickly hit 95 degrees Celsius and then would start to throttle the clock down until it got to a point where it was happy at 95 degrees Celsius and the clock's differential and power differential wasn't jumping too much so you could hold that 95 stably. And this resulted in about 3.5 to 3.55 gigahertz and about 400 to 450 watts CPU package power or about 600, 650 watts from the wall. Now if we compare the Pro Siphon Elite, the outcome was significantly different. And the reason I say that is because we didn't hit 95 degrees Celsius. We did not hit that thermal throttle point. And that is remarkable, quite frankly, from an air cooler. So this beast was dissipating about 600 watts of CPU package power on our wall socket reading for the entire system was about 890 watts at the peak. Over 600 watts. And the peak was actually about 650 watts to 680 watts, depending on which section of the Cinebench or the Ada or the Blender run. That is unbelievable. And it was running consistently and smoothly at 91 degrees Celsius. Absolutely remarkable. The frequency due to this wasn't really downclocked. So it ran at 3.8 gigahertz on all cores, which was about 250 to 300 megahertz higher than the Wraith Ripper, which had to downclock. And because of this, we didn't lose more than about 2% of our Cinebench performance, even over an extended 30 minute period. So that proves that the system was operating completely fine and wasn't throttling down like you would typically see when the target temperature is reached. I'm, I'm honestly extremely impressed with this cooler. So yes, it's a prototype. Yes, it's big and bulky at the moment. Yes, the fans allow. I don't care. The level of performance that this has allowed me to show on Threadripper is unbelievable. I've been able to really open the tap and give Threadripper basically unfiltered access to its power budget because this cooler can handle it. It really is unlimited type performance for the 3990X. I want to see more details on how it compares to some other AIO liquid coolers. I want to see the Noctua U14S and the TR4 version. I want to compare it to custom liquid. So we plan to do all that in follow-up reviews, perhaps with this prototype version, and hopefully when the legit version launches later this year. I'm quite sad that I have to send it back if I'm being honest. I think it's really pretty fair to say that the AMD Ryzen Threadripper 3990X delivers just as we expected, and that's a good thing. The performance in the likes of Cinebench, Corona, 
Blender. So the applications where you can take advantage of 128 threads is absolutely superb. So you get a noticeable and significant improvement versus the 32 core 3970X. The performance in applications which don't really see more than a single processor group in Windows, therefore 64 threads, is again just as expected. So not really any better than the 3970X. So this CPU is just completely wasted on the likes of Handbrake and 7-Zip. POV Ray, AMD has submitted the new code with 128 thread capability to GitHub, but at the moment you're not going to see any benefits. And then Adobe Premiere, for our specific H.264 workload, we didn't see any improvements versus the lower core count Threadripper chips, but there is a suggestion that if you're using higher res footage, if you're using really high bandwidth video files, if you're using H.265 encodes and decodes and renders, you could stress the CPU a bit more. We'll have to do some more testing on that to see if we can see any tangible performance benefits from this 64 core Brute. I think it's really fair to say that if you think you need this processor, then you probably don't need this processor. If you need 128 threads, I would say that you know you need 128 threads and you know that you need this processor. The type of people who are going to be interested in a processor like the 3990X are people who measure their render time, their encode time, their simulation time, the people who measure their time in hours and days, not seconds and minutes, the people who are doing day-to-day -day tasks which really take a significant amount of computational power to be able to just get done, not the people who are doing 4K video editing on the weekend or a few YouTube videos here and there. PBO is just absolutely fantastic. You tell it what to do and it works in the background to operate as best as it can given the parameters that you set. If you only want to give it less than a thousand watts of CPU power but you want the maximum frequency it will do that. So it will ramp up the power towards 1000 watts until your temperature target is hit and then down clock. But this is really good because it's so simple. If you're having cooling concerns then the processor uh, via precision boost overdrive will simply down clock so that your target temperature is still reached but your frequency is not driving above that target temperature. Precision Boost, especially Precision Boost Overdrive, is fantastic. Really, really smart way to run the CPU. If you want to get the maximum out of the CPU with Precision Boost Overdrive, then you need very, very good cooling. Because as we've seen, if you throw power at the CPU, it will take that power and it will translate it into slightly higher frequencies. Now, the higher frequencies are not worth it, in my opinion, because you might get two or 300 extra megahertz for two or 300 extra watts from the wall. But as some people, they want that, and that's perfectly justifiable. But if you are going to push the frequencies, you want something like this Ice Giant Pro Siphon Elite because the amount of power that you have to dissipate through your cooling system is immense. Trying to dissipate over 600 watts of thermal load for sustained periods of time is not easy. I cannot stress that enough. Unless you've dealt with it, it really is hard to comprehend. It is difficult to cool, even with big, beefy conventional air coolers. So something like the unique and very innovative Pro Siphon Elite is actually a good tool to use as we found in our testing and I'm really keen to test this out further in the future. And just to repeat some of the previous feedback that we've said with regards to Threadripper 3000 and the TRX40 platform, they are a superb combination and you can check back to our 3970X and 3960X video review and the written review on Kikaroo to see the details there. But put simply, the TRX40 platform is, in my opinion, the most feature-rich, highest performance platform on the market. You get plenty of PCIe Gen 4 capability, even for multiple graphics cards, 10 gigabit networking, M.2 SSDs, etc. You get high-speed storage interfaces all over the place, and you've got a high bandwidth pipeline between the CPU and the chipset. It is just a fantastic platform for really high performance, really high-end workstation type usage. AMD really did knock it out of the park with this one. And just to add to that, thankfully the motherboard options like the two I've got here are very, very appealing actually on the TRX40 platform. The power delivery solutions across the board are strong from the manufacturers, especially when you go into the high end, and the cooling solutions for the VRM are sensible. I'm not a massive fan of fans on motherboards, but when we were pushing over 600 watts of power through the CPU for over one hour of stress testing, you quickly saw why the fan was necessary on the VRM cooler. So kudos to the motherboard vendors. They know what they were doing. So it's clear that 
you're not really going to see 100% scale in versus the 32 core 3970X on this 64 core part. And that's due to the same TDP between the chips, therefore reduced operating clocks of the 64 core part. But it's also because some software just cannot leverage those additional cores efficiently, even software like Cinebench, for example, where it doesn't scale linearly past a point. Does that make the 3990X bad value because you don't get 100% scale in versus the 32 core, but it costs 100% more? Well, I would say no, not really, and here's why. If you're a content creator, a professional user, or a business, and you can afford to pay 100% more for a process that will give you a 40% uptick in performance, that's perfectly fine, you know, it's a free world, a free market, you can do that. If that additional 40% of performance means that you can raise additional capital through additional projects, if it means that your staff have 40% more time to work on other things, if it means that you can save X number of hours of staff costs of just dead time per week, which, you know, staff aren't cheap, especially in the industries that AMD is targeting, if it means you can do that, it is a justifiable investment and it's actually good value for money, even though it's perhaps not as price efficient as the 32 core or the 24 core or the lower core count parts. Of course, there are more ways than just a workstation and a high performance workstation for which you can leverage a 64 core Threadripper chip. If you're a small business, for example, and you're running a server and there's a handful of you in the office or in your team, this $3,990 chip is $3,000 cheaper than the 64-core Epic. If you can put this 64-core part into your server, maybe you're carving up four VMs for your team, for example, so four 14-core VMs, and you're leaving some core spare for the hypervisor or the Docker containers and encrypted backups and the likes. That's a good solution because you still get the PCIe connectivity. You still get ECC memory support, so you can run ECC memory so that you're happy that your server is going to be consistent and resilient. You can run a high performance GPU passed through to each of those virtual machines because you've got plenty of PCI lanes and the motherboards that support that. You can effectively replace an Epic style server for your small DIY business usage if you're happy to do that. It's clear that AMD is blurring the lines between high-end desktop and workstation parts in Ryzen Threadripper and the server parts in Epic. And I personally think that's a good thing. It's allowing IT departments with constricted budgets to make novel approaches in ways in which they handle their IT challenges. That's a great thing for consumers. It's strikingly clear that the AMD Ryzen Threadripper 3990X is absolutely not a CPU for everybody. The price tag alone tells you it's not for everybody. In fact, it's arguably only for a very select audience, a very few people. Many people who will want probably a lot fewer who will actually consider and then go out and purchase. But those select few who do have the workloads that require this level of computational power, they might go out and purchase this and they might be blown away by the performance that is offered like we were in some of the scenarios. And that is a good thing because AMD has given you a level of performance that simply did not exist prior to this processor. And it is a new tier of performance for the high-end desktop and workstation market. And I think that's a good thing. And I think AMD deserves a lot of credit for keeping on pushing and stamping home the fact that it can do more than its main competitor in this market and it can do it at an affordable reasonable price point put simply the 3990x is amd simply bragging about its position in the high-end desktop workstation market if you are the type of user who really does have the workload to justify this type of processor and you know if you're the person who does have that workload I think this is an absolutely fantastic buy in a really well-designed package on a platform that is fundamentally superb. I've been Luke Hill for Kickeroo. Thanks for watching. Make sure you give us a like and subscribe and do all that YouTube stuff if you like the video. Let us know what you think in the comment section below. Are you the person with the big wallet and the fat credit card who is actually going to go out and buy one of these? Because if you do, please, please let me know in the comment section below because I would love to see that. Check out the full article on the Kickeroo website. That really helps us out. And if you want to support us even more, check out our Patreon page. Buy a cool t-shirt. See you next time around.